Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Thivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati. And what we were discussing, we were discussing about the origin of life and its appearance onto the earth. And what we have said is that the earth life is originated onto the earth in the form of a primitive cell and that primitive cell is developed into the highly organized organisms, either they are belonging to the invertebrate organism or to the vertebrate organisms. In the case of plants also we have uh, we have discussed about the different types of plants whether it is the very simple algae or very very complicated angiosperms. In the previous lecture we discussed about the uh, or in this particular module what we were discussing we were also discussing about the evolutions and how the very simple organism is getting evolved into a very very complicated and the advanced organisms. We have put many type of evidences, we have put the evidences in terms of the morphological or the structural evidences or we have put the embryological or the paleontological evidence. And by giving these evidences, people have put the forward the idea that the evolution was happening and because the evolution, a simple organism is getting evolved into a very, very complex and advanced organisms. In the previous lecture, we discussed about the different types of theories. We said that there are three, three, three theories what people have put forward, the theory of inheritance of the acquired characters, the theory of natural selections and the Hugo Dewey's theories or the mutations theories. In the previous lecture, we discussed about the, the theory of acquired characters given by the Lamarck's and we have discussed how the there are many, uh, uh, many points or many uh, points which are being proposed by the Lamarck's like the use and disuse of the organs or the uh, natural needs or the uh, theory of acquired characters and so on. All these things are being disproved because there are huge criticism of the theory by giving the different types of evidences that which is and ultimately the Wiesmann's the experiments and as well as the Wiesmann theories where it is saying that the the characters could not be the acquired character cannot be inherited from one generation to gener another generations the modification what is happening into the germ cells those are only going to be inherited and based on these observations the scientists have also modified the Lamarck theory and they come up with the idea of neo Lamarckism but the neo Lamarckism also could not be able to explain many observations and that is how people were looking for a better theory and the people were looking for an advanced theory. So, which actually can be uh, very, very, you know, broad, it could be actually be the, uh, ba based on the experimental evidences or it could be based on the some kind of uh, population study or some kind of, you know, a more broader studies. So, they were looking for a theory which was based on the experimental evidences. In that context, the people have what there are three scientists which uh, could come together and that is how they have proposed the theory of natural selections. So, the theory of natural selection was proposed by the two scientists, one is called as the Charles Darwin and the other one is called as the Alfred Ruffel Wallace. So, this is the Charles Darwin and this is the Wallace. In their common publications, both of them conducted scientific data collections from the individual population survey. So, what they have done is they have collected the data from the population survey. In fact, the Charles Darwin traveled for five year expedition around the world onto a ship which is called as the HMS Beagle and HMS Beagle is a famous ship which the Charles Darwin has used to move run around the uh, different types uh, different run around the world and that is how he has collected the different types of you know animals right he has collected the pigeons uh, he has collected the other or animals like birds and he has studied those animals uh, and uh, that is how he come up with the idea of theory of natural selections. During this journey he made observation of the several animals and plants. He keenly observed the similarity among the organism and draw the evolutionary relationship. In addition, he they also got the uh, help from the economist Thomas Malthus. The report on the workers recognized the competition between the species leads to the struggle for the existence. So, this is the uh, Thomas uh, 
Malthus and this is the famous uh, ship which is called as the HMS Beagle. Considering the Wallace view and the Malthus observation of the worker led the Charles Darwin to propose the theory of natural selection in its very famous book which is called as the origin of a species and origin of a species was so famous that it actually was the best selling book on that particular year in fact the number of copies what are being sold for the origin of a species were much more than the the number of copies which people are buying for the bible also so that's how the, it, it says that the the theory of natural selection what is being proposed by the darwin was actually been very very you know interesting and exciting to explain the uh, evolutions so let's see what are the uh, the assumptions what the uh, what the uh, uh, darwin has made the theory of the natural selection the theory of natural selections is based on the following point the first point is the rapid multiplication so it has multiple points it has uh, and the first point is the rapid multiplication so what the darwin says that every organism has the enormous ability to reproduce to continue its species right all animals and plants tend to multiply in geometrical progression for example an organism will be doubled in first year four times in second year and eight times in a third year and so on so this means the production is actually on a uh, on a logarithm uh, on a on a geometrical progression right so you can if you start even with the one organism it is going to be double right within one year right or after the first generation then it is going to be 4 then it is going to be 8 then it is going to be 16 so this is when you started with the single plant like if you started with single plant it will become 16 plant in four generations so let's see the examples of the organism to understand the potential of the organism to multiply these examples are as follows uh, so we have a first example of paramecians in its multiplication rate of three times in 48 hours which means in two days it is actually going to be get tripled so if the single paramecium will allow to grow and multiply in five years it will give a mass equal to the 10,000 times to the size of the earth which means if you allow a paramecium which is actually going to be multiplied three times in 48 hours a single paramecium will will grow and multiply if you allow the grow and multiply for five years it will actually going to give you the the total mass which is equivalent to the 10,000 times to the size of the earth then we have fish so if you have the cod fish the cod fish produces 1 million eggs in a year if all these eggs will give rise to the fishes the whole atlantic ocean will be filled in five years you can actually calculate how many how many uh, fishes are going to be produced if you allow these you know and all these you know million fishes are also going to produce so if you try to calculate it is going to be very very huge number similarly we have the oysters an oyster may lay, a lay these many eggs at a single spanning but if all the oyster grow and survive up to the adulthood for five generation then the number of oyster will more than the number of electrons into the universe similarly even if for the bigger animals like the elephants elephant has a average lifespan of 90 years and during the whole lifespan he can produce only six offsprings so it he, even it is a big animal it has uh, its production rate is very low which means a single elephant is actually going to give you the six, six offsprings okay if all the offspring survived and single elephant pair would produce one this many elephants in 750 years this means even if the bigger animals like elephant if they were if they were if you allow them to grow for you know the reproduction they will be going to be very very high number the plants also plant produces thousands of seeds every year so plant every organism so what the point what the Darwin was putting an emphasis is that every organism has the enormous ability to produce to maintain its species 
but you know that the number of number of these species or their number is also not very high right they will be remain under constant so why, how it is so it is so because you have the limited natural resources in spite the enormous capacity of our organism to reproduce the number of individual species remain constant you don't see the elephants everywhere right you see uh, a few elephants but you don't see that number what we have just discussed right it is happening it is because the there is a natural there is a limited natural resources and all the elephants require the food they require water they require oxygen and so on and it is due to the increase in population in animal or plant require more space and food and ultimately the food to the plant or animal is provided by the uh, by the carbon dioxide from the air water and mineral from the soil so the amount of these basic material is limited in universe right you have a limited natural resources uh, you have a limited number of water, you have a limited amount of oxygen, you have a limited amount of carbon dioxide and even the sunlight is also limited, right? So, hence it does not allow the population of the organism grow beyond the limit and an equilibrium is reached, right? An equilibrium is reached where you have the production of few organisms and then you have the death of the same organism. So, because of that there is a complete, complete uh, balance how that balance is happening that balance is happening because there is a struggle for the existence due to the shortage of the food water and space there is a severe competition among the offspring for the existence for example if you start with the elephant and if the elephant has produced the six offspring all these six six offsprings actually require the one thing right they require the food they require water and they require the space so, if all the six are requiring the same thing, they will actually going to fight with each other for all these natural resources and because of that, some of the offsprings are actually going to get the food, some of the offsprings are not going to get the food. So, every individual has a few basic requirements such as the food, space, water, they are also looking for the their uh, partners right to, so that they can be able to reproduce and then they also require the protection from the enemy and if anything goes wrong for example if they could not get the food or space or water or they could not get a space to hide so that they can get protected from the animal that is actually going to end their life so because of this there will be a competition and because of that they will they all the six are not going to survive right there there could be some uh, some of the offspring which are going to die same is true for this elephant also this elephant also could die in due course right because it may not be able to get the food water or space or it cannot get the protection from the animal uh, enemy as well so in order to achieve basic need the organism compete with each other and it is known as the struggle for the existence the struggle for an individual can be of three types so you can have the three different types of struggles what is the struggle struggle is intraspecific intraspecific struggles the competition of the individual of the same species is called as the intraspecific uh, struggles for example the fight between the two dog for a piece of meat war is another example of intraspecific struggles among the different humans right so if you have what you might have seen the dog the fight between the two dog right for a piece of meat uh, you might have seen the you know around the butcher's shop there is a you know a lot of dogs which are sitting and waiting for their piece to get but as soon as he throws the piece of meat there are multiple dogs which for fight for that particular piece of meat so who will get it that is going to be the winner so winner is actually going to get the ability to survive whereas the losers are actually going to not get the food for a very very long time and that's how they are actually going to die then we have the interspecific struggle the competition of the individual of the different species which means if you have a uh, no bird and if you have the frog for example or suppose you have the snake right so in that case the frog is actually going to 
require a protection from the snake right it has to have the ability so that it can actually take up the food and nutrition and all that thing and it also could get the uh, protection from the snake same is that snake also should get protection from the bird so that's how if the the struggle or the competition among the individual of the different species for example the tiger attacks on the deer for the food right so tiger has to be uh, tiger should attack onto the deer to gain the food deer should be get protected from the tiger then only it can be able to survive so that competition is called as the interspecific struggles and then the third is the environmental struggles so every individual struggle against the change in the environment such as change in the temperature humidity level of water rain and climate etc so these three kind of different types of uh, changes could actually be responsible for the struggle of the existence and once you struggle you are actually going to change yourself right you are going to be intelligent then only you can get protected for example the deer right deer has to adopt the new and new schemes and new and new way so that it could get hide from the tiger similarly the frog frog should actually be able to intelligent enough so that it would that you know hide into the some bushes or some you know deep, deeper uh, places so that it should not get caught by the snake same is true for the snake also a snake should also have the better and better abilities so that it could be able to uh, be able to catch the frog and then only it can actually be able to get the food so if you actually keep developing these kind of strategies you are actually going to be keep varying yourself from your uh, offspring or your from your uh, you know from your other partner other members of that particular species and because of that there will be a variation so there will be a variation each and every individual varies in different uh, several aspects from the other individuals like right? just now we have discussed right a frog who has to survive from the snake will probably going to change many things it may change the skin color it may change the uh, the size it may change the some of the other kinds of features and that's how it actually is going to be a very very different from its other uh, individuals even the offspring produced by the parents also differ in their aspects the two individual can be different from each other in their behavior color size and strength right you might have seen right when the you and your brother or you your sister may not be identical right they are different from each other from the beginning itself they are different from each other from the by birth right they are intelligent in they are different in terms of their intelligence they are they are different in terms of their different type skills your sister could be very good in terms of drawing your brother could be very good in you know cricketing you might be very good in hockey and so on so so that kind of you know that kind of behaviors and that kind of changes are happening from the birth itself right and that could uh, by training the and by these experimental by these uh, uh, struggles you are actually improving those abilities and then there will be a natural selections so due to the variation among the different individual they struggle towards their existence for different potential for example there could be two individual there could be two individual individual a individual b this guy is not good right so if you are if you have two different types of frogs and if this guy is not very good from getting the protection from the snake this guy is going to be killed in due course whereas this guy is going to survive and that's how this the lineage of this b guy's lineage is actually going to continue whereas the a guy's lineage is actually going to remove from the information so that's how this a is actually going to be a new species the b is another going to be a new species the variation in an individual may allow him to survive and complete its life cycle comfortably whereas if the variations are unfavorable the individual will struggle against every odd and as a result it may not be able to complete its life cycle for example fast running deer has better chance of escaping from the tiger compared to the slow runner this is another example right you have two deers one is uh, so you have two deers right deer 1 
deer 2 this deer is very fast right so he will whenever the tiger will come he will run away where this one is slow right so whenever the tiger will come he will actually catch this deer so this means the population of the B will go down whereas the population of A will go up and that is how the deer 1 is actually going to capture that particular place. Another factor is the ability to adopt into the change environment. Both Darwin and Wallace recognized the environment as the principal factor for the natural selections. So there are many uh, time when you are even very very powerful, we are very strong but you cannot be able to adopt due to the change environment. One of the classical example is the dinosaur, right? Dinosaur as per the uh, latest uh, theory is could not be able, they were cold blooded animal, right? They were cold blooded animals. What is meant by the cold blooded animal? Cold blooded animals are the animal which cannot regulate their body temperature, okay? Regulate body temperature, which means they actually have to go, they, they will adopt the same temperature of the environment. So if they, they will be cold, so they will, they will not be able to regulate the body temperature. For example, humans are not cold blooded animals. They are uh, the, uh, the other kind of animal, right? So, so they could not be able to regulate the body temperature. So if there will be cold, they will actually going to feel the cold. If they will be hot, they are actually going to feel the hot. So because of this kind of variations, dinosaur could not be able to adapt to these changed environments. So there will be a, if there will be a low temperature, they will not be able to survive because they cannot regulate the body temperature and that's how the dinosaur could not be able to survive and they will be get vanished or they will be get extincted. For example, the ant plants with ability to hold more water and can be able to reduce the loss of water will ultimately survive despite the physical strength, height and the other characters. So this is another example. If you have a plant which actually can have the ability to hold more water and can be able to reproduce, uh, reduce loss of water. For example, you have a plant like cactus, right? So cactus survive even in a hot weather because cactus is converting its leaves into spine, right? You might have seen, right? Cactus with the spine. These spines are nothing, but they are modified leaves. Now, these, if you change the leaf to a spine, what you're doing is you are actually reducing the loss of water because the leaf is actually leaving the water from the stomata, right? So, if the, there will be a loss of water from the leaf, that is actually a problem. But when you convert these leaves into a spine, because the leaf, you know, you have seen, right? Leaf is very, very uh, big, right? So that has a very large surface area, and because of that, the evaporation is going to be fast. Whereas when you convert that leaf into a spine, the 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 surface area is going to be reduced, and because of that, it is actually going to reduce the evaporation. So that's how that's these are the modifications. Any 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 plant who will do this kind of modification is actually going to survive into a hard and the low water uh, area whereas the other plants are actually going to die. Another example we have discussed about the dinosaur as well. Now once you have these kind of thing then you have to have an inheritance of the useful variations. The individual survives due to unique variations mate and produce of their offspring to complete their life cycle. As a result, they transfer the useful variation to the next generation and allow the individual to multiply. Darwin believed that any variation which can help the individual to survive and help to favorable for struggle will be inherited. He considered the variation which may be acquired or to the inheritable. For example, just now we discussed, right, if the elephant is or frog for example if the frog has to hide from the snake it suppose you have two different types of frog right frog number one frog number two uh, this frog has changed its skin color right it has an inherent it has the ability to change its skin color whereas it cannot so this means this guy is not going to survive whereas this guy is going to survive and if it survives, it is actually going to mate to the uh, another 
individual and that is how the number of this particular frog will go up right and that is how it is actually going to be present in the environment. And if it is present in the environment, it is actually going to form a new species. So, as a result of struggle and natural selection, only the individual fits to the environmental condition will survive and complete its life cycle. As a result, the number of these individuals will increase over the course of time compared to the less favorable organisms. In addition, the variation favoring will be inherited to the next generation whereas unfavorable variation will be discarded. Due to continuous selection, a new organism will appear which will be different from their ancestral form. This means if you started with a frog which cannot change its skin color, you might have you know one frog which actually can change the skin color, the other will be another frog which is normal, right? So you have normal frog, you have the frog which can actually be able to change its skin color. So if it can be able to change the skin color, it can get disappeared into the bushes. It can disappear into the green grass, right? And that's how it cannot be get caught by the snake. Now, this guy is actually going to caught, right? So, if this guy will actually going to be keep reproducing, and so another generation also, again the same thing is going to happen. It is going to produce the two different types of frog. It may have produced the frog which may not be able to change the skin, but it will actually going to produce the frog which is actually going to be change the skin. So, this frog again will survive and if this will continue for several generations, what will happen is this is actually going to be evolved as a separate species. It will get changed from the frog, not only in terms of skin color, it may also acquire the different types of additional characters. So, these good variations are actually going to be get selected by the, nat by the nature and these good selections are eventually will form a new species. So, we will say oh there is a new frog, the frogs could be which can change its skin color or it can actually make the skin so slippery that the frog can, uh, the snake cannot be able to catch him and all other kinds of characters. So, because of that it is actually going to form the new species. And that is how the, the Darwin has explained the development, uh, the production or the generation of the new species. So, let us understand this uh, by a classical example of the giraffe. So, what the Darwin has produced, uh, Darwin has proposed, uh, Darwin has proposed its theory on the three, these points. One is the rapid multiplications, then you have the natural selections, then you have the struggle for the existence, then you have the variation, then you have the natural selections and then you have the inheritance of the useful variations and then you have the formation of new species. Now, see here, you have, so what Darwin has said is that you have the two different types of giraffes. You have a giraffe which was look like a deer. So, you have the giraffe which was deer like giraffe and there was a giraffe which was a natural giraffe what we could see nowadays. So, you have, a, this is the giraffe and this is the deer like giraffe. So, this deer like giraffe when it was present into the environment and so, initially there was a grass, so the both of these species were surviving, but then there was a scarcity of grass and the leaves were only available onto the trees. So, when the leaves were only available on the tree, this particular deer like gra uh, giraffe could not be able to get the nutrition because his, his neck was small, right? So, he cannot reach to these uh, trees. So, because of that, they actually start dying and this guy was only surviving and this guy was surviving. So, he started mating with uh, the another giraffe and that is how they, their, their number is increasing and that is how we could be able to see a new species. So, this is what is written here that you have the two different types of giraffe present onto the other, deer like short height and the long leg and the four limbs, right, which are the uh, current uh, giraffe what you see. So, until the grass was available on the land, both of these species were surviving and be able to compete with their life cycle. With change in the climate and reduction of the grass, there might be a struggle for the food, right? So, that was the, it said, right? You, there will be a scarcity of the natural, uh, natural resources, which means in this case, there will be a scarcity of grass. Then there will be a struggle, right? Because the, some guy could not get the food. So, the giraffe with long neck and the forehem 
four arms can still be able to eat the leaf from the tree but the deer like giraffe could not be able to reach there and died due to the starvation in in the due course the several round of the natural selection led to the giraffe with the long neck and the four arms dominated the region and be present as a new species so that's how the the, the darwin has explained the uh, generation of the uh, giraffe what we see in the present time there are other examples also there are other example is the natural artificial selections from ancient time the man is selecting good breed animals and plant for their use in addition they are performing the cross breeding of these species to develop the newer breed with the desirable character the scientists supporting the darwin's theory explained the evolution to the natural selection to give rise to the new species just like following similar mechanism as the artificial selection by the man they further added that the natural selection is a slow process but much more complex compared to the artificial selection for example you can see these are the sheep right so the people were developing the sheep which was having a low height right so if you, they are having a low height they cannot be able to run away from their barricades and that's how they would be preferred right then we have the mimicry and the protective coloration the mimicry and the protective coloration is a very common uh, in several organism as the product of the natural selection most of these organism acquired the pattern of coloration by gradually changing the color at each stage so that was a, also a natural uh, another example which says that because of the forced conditions because of the uh, conditions which are uh, forcing them you have to change the conditions then you have the correlation of the nectarines and the proboscis the position of the nectarine and proboscis in insects correlate as well and match well to the facilitate uh, pollination this relation does not develop in single days but eventually gradually emerges through the process of natural selection so you know that the nectarines are uh, you know containing the food right it contains the food for the animal for the insects right and that's why you have a very set pair of uh, flowers you have a very set pair of insects and this proboscis and the nectarines combination is matching with each other and that does not happen in the single day it happens because there is a natural selection these insects are only going to come and take the nutrition or the food uh, the nectar from these nectarines and that's how they will be only going to do the pollination for these uh, plants so that's these are the few examples but these examples are not enough because the people were coming up with the different types of uh, uh, objections so there were objections against the theory of natural selection as well what are these evidences the evidence is one of these is, is the perpetuation of the vestigial organs we know that the vestigial organ the organs which are non functional but they are still be present in the uh, the new generations those are called as the vestigial organs their classical example is the wisdom teeth in the case of the human right so you have a wisdom teeth uh, which is uh, considered to be a vestigial organ or there are other uh, things also right you have the uh, caudal tail and something like that so vestigial organs are selected despite the fact they are not useful for animal but even then they are preserved generation over generation so you know that we have all have the different types of vestigial organs then there is no explanation for the variation darwin could not be able to explain the source and the mechanism of variation in the organism but he so he could not be able to explain why there could be a variation what is the mechanism of the variation so he still having the same kind of issue what lemark was having right lemark could not be able to even explain how the acquired character will be inherited how the uh, the the acquired character will go into the germ cells and same kind of uh, problem was there for the darwin also then the distinction between the continuous and the discontinuous uh variations so according to the theory darwin assumed that the any variation essential for the animal survival will be carry forward to the next generation we know that it is not true and as per the current knowledge of the genetics right so any any uh, character which you are acquired for your own existence will not be going to go into the next generations 
then we have the disapproval of the pangenesis theory of Darwin. So, Darwin put forward the theory of pangenesis to explain the process of inheritance. It was disapproved by the experiment per, uh, performed by the August Wiesman in the 1892, right. So, uh, so, so these are the few objections what people have put uh, forward against the net against the theory of natural selections and so that is why the people have looking for some of the explanation they, they were looking for the explanation for the variation and then they will be also looking for how the different way what are the different characters which are actually going to be carry forward from the single generation to the next generation. To explain those phenomena the Hugo de Vries actually proposed the new theory and that theory is called as the mutation theory or the Hingo Dubis theories. So, what the Hingo Dubis theory is that the theory of Lamarck or the Darwin is based on the population study, but both theory could not be to be explain the origin of the variation and their mode of transmission from the one generation to the next, next generation. So, that was the major objection what was there in the both the theories, the Lamarck theory or the Darwin theory that they could not be able to explain the origin of the variation and as well as their mode of transmission from the one generation to the next generation. To understand the gap, the Dutch botanist Hugo de Vries actually has put forward the mutation theory in the 1901. And according to the de Vries, mutation theory state that the new species arise from the pre-existing ones in a single generation by the sudden disappearance of the new feature through a genetic variation known as the mutations. So, what he said is that evolution is not a slow process, it happens all of a sudden uh, because of some kind of environmental changes, it actually causes a mutation into the germ plus and because of that it actually uh, allows the appearance of the new species. So, contrast to the earlier theories whether it is a Lamarck theory or the Darwin theory, Debris propose that the evolution is a sudden discontinuous and jerky process rather than the continuous and the gradual process. He termed the process as selation that is a single step large mutations. In addition, the natural selection works on the mutation, preserve the mutation found useful and eliminate the mutations with the harmful mutations. But he did not support the struggle between the organism considered the coexistence of them with a parent species. So, what the uh, Hugo de Vries normally said is that if you have a cell, okay, then all of a sudden there will be a mutation. So, what will happen is its genome is actually going to get mutated and that is how you are actually going to have the two different types of cell, right? one which is having the original cell, the other one is actually going to have the changed mutated one. So, this mutated one is actually going to survive if these mutations are helping this particular organism to grow, but if it is not then it is actually going to uh, will not allow the uh, this particular organism to replicate or uh, go further and that is how it is actually going to die. So, what he said is that the mutation which are useful uh, are actually going to be preserved whereas the mutations which are actually going to be harmful for the organism they are actually going to be eliminated. He did the several experiments to prove that. So, what are the experiments? To test the proposed mechanism, Hugo de Vries conducted the experiment on the plant called as the evening primrose or the orienthara lemecana. Okay? He observed the subtle but the significant change between the different wildlife varieties. So, what he has done is he has taken a, uh, the evening primrose plant and then he actually uh, you know he breed them okay so, and once he done the breeding like the cell pollinations after that he got the seeds and then he started growing them so what happened is there you it you could found that the majority of the plants are giving the, the normal plants but there are some plant which were actually having the different plants right so different he was getting the different plants if it even if it is getting uh, getting the different plant which is actually he is uh, uh, termed as the mutant plant, uh, if you even if you do the cell pollinations, right, you are going to get the 
different plants like you are going to get some different plants and you are going to get the more different plants. So this means in every generation what it says is that if you do the even the cell pollinations in every generation there will be a normal plants and then there will be a mutant plant. For example, if you go to the second generation again there will be a normal plant or the different plants whereas in the mutated plant. So this will continue and any mutant which is allowing the survival will actually going to propagate any mutant which is actually going to be lethal it is actually going to this uh, does not allow the uh, running of that particular mutant. So what he said is that uh, he found that the mutations appeared suddenly and were inherited by the offsprings and DVs find the four different types of plants progressive which means the plant with the new traits retro progressive which means that has reduced or lost the traits compared to the plant which means it has gone to the one generation back. Then it has a degressive so plant with the weak or the low survival and then it got the inconstant. These plants are unstable and they resemble plant uh, they resemble the parents as well as at times the produce the variations. So you are getting the four different types of plants progressive, retro progressive, deprogressive and inconsistent. So important conclusion from the de Vries mutation theory are as follows. So based on that experiment he has actually made the conclusions. Uh, what are the conclusions? The mutations are the initial factor for the evolution. Then the mutants are non-predictable, occur suddenly and produce their effect instantly. So there is a no delay in no delay in evolution. That is a major point from the Hugo de Vries uh, the theory of mutations which means it says that the mutants are non-predictable, they occur suddenly and they produce their effect within the next generations. So within the single generation you would be able to see a change a phenotype. So the, no intermediate stage between the appearance of the mutant form and the parent plants. Then the mutations are cumulative in nature and occurs on the multiple occasion to increase the frequency of mutation into the populations. So mutations which are good, which are useful, which are good, they are actually going to be accumulate even if they are getting into, even if that is happening onto the multiple occasions and that will increase the frequency of these mutants organism into the, uh, these organism, the mutated organism into the populations. Because the mutation is making the organism more strong, right? So if the, if, so the strong or a mutation is going to be accumulated in the populations. A single mutation may give rise to the new species. And at last the environmental factor works as a selection pressure to allow the growth of the beneficial mutant and eliminate the leader or the non useful mutation. So what it says is that you, you start with the parents and there will be a mutation, right? after the mutations you are going to have the multiple types of offsprings right and all these offsprings are actually going to face the environment once the they will change the environment this is going to be like for example if you have three four different types of mutations this all these one two three four are going to face the environmental conditions and those who are going to survive the environmental conditions for example the if the mutation number 1 is going to survive that is actually going to result into the formation of the new species. Uh, this is what he has done right if you start with the parents okay you are going to do the cell pollinations then you are going to produce the offsprings right. So the mutation are actually going to create the variations you see that this is a wild type this is the mutant number 1 and this is the mutant number 2 because uh, the this this mutant the mutant 0 is actually not good right because the unfavorable mutations it will actually going to select against so if there will be unmuted unfavorable mutation it is actually going to not going to survive so there will be no survival whereas these two mutants are actually be going to be selected 
and again they will go with the another round of mutations right another round of reproduction and the mutations that mutation will continue right and that's how if the another generation they will be generated the mutations which is like a and b and both of these a and b mutations are not useful then they are actually going to not going to survive whereas the favorable mutations may likely to survive for example in this case you have first generated a single mutations in the first generation then in the second generation again there will be mutations so it has generated the third generation then third generation again got mutation and that's how that's how you see the population of this particular mutant the mutant 2 is now overtaken the whole populations and that is what the hingo debris has proved by doing the multiple mutation uh, multiple uh, uh, experiments and because it was very very well defined based on the experiments people are come up with the different types of evidences to prove that uh, these the the evidences to prove the hingo dubris theory was as the experiment performed by the debris was reproduced by the several other scientists and they came to the similar conclusion so that was the first thing which was positive for the hingo dubris the mutation theory the mutations found spontaneously in nature and these sudden appearance of mutation variation has turned the mutation theory. These mutations found in nature are as follows. For example, the Ancon ship, sheep was produced by an ordinary sheep in a single step in 1891. The mutated sheep was short height and it was useful for farmers as they could not be able to jump from the low stone fences. Then we have the hornless or the polled hornbird cattle was produced in a single step in 1899 from the normal parents which means with a single mutations or single mutations you can be able to develop a particular different species. The hairless cattle, dog and mice were produced from the normal parents in a single step. Uh, then we have the different types of uh, experiment in the plant like Oenothrana lemincana has 14 chromosome but the mutations were having only in uh, were in this kind of uh, 30 chromosomes. Then we have mutations are genetically linked and the inheritable. So what we could count is that the, the mutations what are being produced in these animals are genetically linked and the inheritable and the single large mutations can produce knee special implant for example the delicious apple. So what people have found is that there is a single mutation and that is actually producing the new species. But despite these experimental evidences and a foolproof theory the people are coming up with the objections. So there are evidences against the theory, there are evidences against the mutation theory proposed by the Hingo Dubris. What are the objections? The mutations are of the rare occurrence and it is difficult to assume that all the animals or the plants the sheet could appear solely by the mutation. So mutation is a very very rare phenomenon. It could happen and it could be a inducing factors but it could not be explained that the only the mutation is the responsible factor for the development of so many species. The relationship between the flower and the insect such as the length of the proboscis in insect and the position of nectaris in flower cannot be explained by the mutation theory. So the relationship between the two intersecting species like the, the species which are helping to each other cannot be explained by the mutation theory. How the two, how as uh, insect is being evolved in such a way that it is actually having a so, you know the well and well defined or suited uh, proboscis so, so that it can be able to take up the nutrition from the flower and at the same time it also can be able to help the plant to the go for the pollinations. The mutations are recessive whereas it is generally be the dominant mutation that bring out the evolutions. So there are mutations which are recessive, there are mutations which are dominant. So the Hingo Dubris could not be able to explain these particular type of aspects and that is how the mechanism of evolution or the theory of the mutation theory was also not could not be able to explain each and every phenomena what is happening. So what we have discussed, we have discussed about the different types of theories. We have discussed, we started with the Lamarck's theory and then we have also discussed about the theory of natural selection and as well as the Hingo Dubris theories of mutation theory. Every theory has 
some positives and some negatives and at the end what you could see is there is a probably all the theories were not complete and all the theories were not conclusive to explain the how the evolution could have happened but if you summarize them and you could you know try to conclude something you will understand that the hugo what hugo would has done he said is that there could be a generation of mutations right there could be a mutation generation and in that the environmental factor could have been playing a crucial role because you know that the uh, solar radiation and as well as the uv radiation could have actually made the mutations and these mutations could be helpful for the organism or could be uh, lethal for the organisms and that's how it is actually it is you know making the uh, the, the variation within the species. So, you see the, if you mix the theory of Darwin's theory and if you mix the Hingo Dubis theory, you could be able to understand the full pictures. But as I said, none of these theories were conclusive in terms of explaining the, uh, the mechanism of evolution. So, with this I would like to conclude my lecture here. Uh, in our subsequent lecture, we are going to discuss some more aspects related to the uh, living organisms. Thank you.